Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Motive Spotlight. Today we're going to be joined by Dr. Fiona Flynn, a qualified educational psychologist holding a doctorate in educational, child, and adolescent psychology from Queen's University. She's also a registered practitioner psychologist with the Health and Care Professions Council. Dr. Flynn works in a specialist post for the Educational Psychology Service Northern Ireland, working with students, parents, and schools to provide support and intervention for students with social, emotional, and behavioral difficulties. Fiona has a special interest in working with students with mental difficulties, trauma, and social-emotional difficulties. So just to get us started, how are you? Really crazy time, COVID. How are you doing right now? I am good, thank you very much. Um, yeah, busy, work is very busy and the restrictions are easing a little bit here in Northern Ireland. So it's been nice to get to see people again. That's definitely helped. Good, good. Not out is in the US, so I'm really happy for you right now. Could you tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, so as you said, I'm a child and adolescent educational psychologist. And um, so my background is in psychology and um, I did my bachelor's in psychology, then a master's and then went on to do my, my doctoral training. Um, I grew up in Ireland, but I've also lived in California and Dubai. Um, so I like the sun. I like good weather. Um, Ireland's pretty rainy. And I'm also very into health and fitness in general. I teach yoga in my spare time. Um, mainly hot yoga and um, play a lot of hockey, field hockey over here. Um, but in general, we'll just be very into kind of physical and mental health needing to be, you know, in alignment with each other. So what exactly inspired you to start working with students and pursuing the educational field? Well, I suppose I have always really enjoyed working with children and young people um, from a sort of a personal level I have a younger sister who has autism and I suppose growing up and seeing the some of the challenges that she faced and just seeing how her life was always just a little bit more difficult than, than mine and, and my siblings um, really inspired me to want to work with young people who have additional challenges and you know if you can do anything to make their life a little bit better um, or to support the family um, I felt very motivated to do that and I suppose it doesn't, it can be any kind of mental health difficulty or additional need of any kind. You know, if you can be a support for that young person, you can, you know, if you can add value, I think that's a very fulfilling thing to do. Um, and certainly I find it very fulfilling. So um, I just sort of naturally kept following my areas of interest and it's led me to, to the career I'm in now. So do you think having that type of background with your sister helps you to advocate for whether it be injustice, discrimination or stigma within mental health and psychology? I think so. I think, from, um, I think on a personal level, it's always helpful that you can maybe connect with people. Sometimes it's with parents to say, look, I understand from your point of view what it's like to, to live with someone who has these different challenges that maybe it's hard to understand initially. I think it's really important when you can make those kind of personal connections or, or people feel like they can relate to you, that you understand on a personal level what, what some of the challenges are. And I think in terms of, you know, dealing with stigma and discrimination, um, a big part of it is education. You know, um, the lack of education and, and ignorance is what leads to stigma and, and to people not respecting difference. Um, so a big part of my, my job is about educating, um, whether it's the young people themselves around their mental health difficulties or any diagnoses that they've maybe recently had to understand, well, what does that diagnosis mean and what does it not mean? You know, dispelling a lot of the myths that are out there around all sorts of, you know, developmental disorders and, and also trying to, um, I suppose, use language that's helpful and not hurtful or harmful. And, and, you know, I think a lot of the casual language that people use around developmental disorders, mental health disorders is not, you know, it's not helpful. And, and I think a lot of the time the intentions are not bad, but the impact it has on the young person who maybe has um, an additional need of some kind is what's important and and you know just doing that bit of work a lot of it is with teachers so that teachers will understand um, their students needs and how to support their students needs in a way that is helpful for the student not harmful and in a way that doesn't stigmatize them 
Um, so for me, education for everybody involved in, in that young person's life is, is really crucial. And I think being able to relate on a personal level just adds to that. I think people engage well with you when you're able to do that. Yeah, definitely. Education is very important. So just on a day-to-day -day level, do you have any words or tips for people who are in the same position as you, have siblings or even friends that are on the spectrum? And do you have any ways for them to overcome the daily challenges that could arise? I mean, I think um, it's always really helpful to ask the, the individual themselves, you know, what, what would you like me to, what words would you like me to use? You know, for example, some, some people with autism don't like to be called autistic. They prefer to be known, you know, I have autism and other people feel different. I think what's, what happens is we get like generalizations, you know, use this term for that person. Whereas I'll always just ask the person, what, what would you like me, what sort of language would you like me to use around this diagnosis? What is it that you relate to? And, and you know, how do you identify yourself? And, and I think we can all do that, whether it's a family member or a friend. And I think we don't feel comfortable enough to just ask them that sometimes. Um, and it's almost like a taboo. Should I mention this or should I not mention this? In my experience, people who have additional needs would rather have it out in the open and have that conversation. Um, and if you initiate it, it, it's almost freeing for them. You know, they're finally able to, to talk about it. So I would certainly say, you know, don't shy away from it, um, but do it in a respectful way and, and ask the individual themselves, what, what can I do? How would you like me to, um, you know, speak with you about this or what, what do you not like? Um, and they may not have the answers and that's okay too. You know, they'll figure that out as, as they grow older um, and they learn more about themselves as well. You'd say it's a, it's a bit important to know that, you know, you can make mistakes along the way as long as you have the right intent. Absolutely. And I think just acknowledging that you made a mistake and, and acknowledging that even though my intentions were good, I understand that the impact that I had on you was not good. And I will apologize for that. I won't try and hide behind um, the fact that I didn't intend any offense and, and maybe you're being a bit sensitive, you know that's not helpful. We have to say, yes, I'm, I am sorry. I, I did not mean that to, to impact you the way it did, but I, I have done that. And so I apologize. What's a more helpful way next time? What can I do better? Um, and yeah, absolutely. Just owning your mistakes um, and, and learning from them rather than trying to, you know, defend them and, and, and justify them. Definitely. I mean, it's the people that we love, right? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. So considering all of this, it sounds like you have a really strong background related to mental health, neurodivergence. So when exactly did you know that becoming a psychologist was the path for you? Um, probably when I was 18, I actually always thought I wanted to do law. I was sure I was going to be a lawyer and kind of the way it works in Ireland, uh, you have to write down your choices for your, for university. And, um, I did on like the last day, I just changed my mind. I just, I wrote in psychology instead. And it was mainly because I'd just gotten really into understanding human behavior. Um, I suppose, you know, that period of life, your adolescence is quite interesting because peer acceptance is so important. And maybe as a teenager, you maybe act in ways that later on you maybe reflect on and think, well, you know, why did I do that? I only did that because of the people I was with or, or whatever it might be. And I just got very interested into kind of human behavior and mob mentality and, and things like that. Um, so yeah, I just decided I'll do psychology for my bachelor's degree. I mean, I think psychology is a great undergraduate degree to, to do because you can go into loads of different things after it. You know, you might go into sales and marketing. You might go into high performance. Um, you might go into something like forensic psychology. So um, I didn't know I wanted to be a child psychologist when I went in, when I started my psychology studies, as I say, that sort of happened naturally um, as I went on to, to specialize over time. So just like one split second decision and it's completely <laughs> determined your entire life for the better, I think. <laughs> Pretty well. Oh God, definitely for the better. I mean, some of my friends are lawyers and I am so glad I did not go into that field. So no, yeah, yeah, you're right. It was a, a kind of a, really sudden well you know just one of those kind of gut feeling moments and I decided to go with it and yeah I'm glad I did we're glad you did too <laughs> so this kind of reminds me of your Instagram account called at educational psychologist and I anyone listening please make sure you follow wanted to ask you why did you create it you know what was the goal 
Well, um, I think a big part of it was what, what we've talked about already around education, you know, um, just trying to normalize mental health. Um, you know, I do think we should be talking about our mental health as much as we talk about our physical health, you know. Um, so I think a big part of it is about education. My, my intention is for it to be, you know, informed, evidence-based information from a professional source, you know, rather than, you know, memes and stuff. Um, and by having it on, on Instagram, it's just to make it accessible, you know, for young people, for parents, for teachers. Because I suppose what I was finding was, I, you know, like I said, I do a lot of training with schools. Um, and so much of the time that the teachers or parents or whoever would come up to me after and say like, oh, I wish I'd known about this five years ago. I wish I'd known about this 10 years ago. And I mean, definitely teacher training should have far more um, in it about how to work with students with additional needs, but that's a conversation for another day. So I just thought, well, like, let's, let's start putting some resources and information up in a very accessible way. Um, and, and, yeah, I mean, I, I should probably put more time into it than I do. Um, I'm not that Instagram savvy, but, um, you know, it, my, my goal is that if it makes a positive difference to anybody, then that I've achieved my goal. And, and certainly the feedback has been has always been positive. So um, that, that's what's kind of driving me to do it. So do you think maybe with the rise of social media and just how our generation, Z, like Gen Z, has become more pseudo woke and more knowledgeable do you think that perhaps we're more open or less stigmatized in our generation than perhaps people were and even parents were when you were growing up I mean I think so yes um I think that would be my experience I mean even when I was in school which yeah is longer ago than I would like to think but I mean no one in my class had any kind of diagnosis there was no one was considered special educational needs but there definitely were students who did have needs. They just weren't being recognized. They certainly weren't being diagnosed. And again, that would have been even more drastic in my parents' generation. Um, so certainly I think that the heightened awareness that, are out, that is out there is really, really, really important. And, and I mean, like what you guys are doing, it's just fantastic you know, to see this being led by young people and normalizing it. Um, you know, if I'm working with young people and they'll, they'll be embarrassed, you know, to, to tell their friends that they go to a therapist or that they go to a psychologist. And I say, you know, would you tell your friends that you were going to a dentist appointment? And they say, yeah, of course I would. I'm like, well, but what's the difference? You know, what, why is our mental health so stigmatized compared to our physical health? So I do think things are getting better, but I think we still have a journey to go um, and things exactly like modern divergence are, are really helpful in that journey. Yeah, we definitely have a way to go, but I'm glad that, you know, we share the same idea that we're going in the right direction. Definitely. And I do, you know, I actually do quite a bit of group work, um, which is really nice. I do it mainly with adolescents and to see them sharing with each other their, their challenges and their struggles and being open with each other about it and the connections that they make. And, oh, you do that too. I thought I was the only one and you get anxious about that too. Oh, that like, so do I. Um, and to see them, that moment when they realize they're not alone with their challenges, that other teenagers have them too, it, that is worth about, you know, $500 worth of therapy and all it took was half an hour in, in, you know, in a group or whatever. So um, there's certainly seeing young people able to share like that. I don't think that would have happened, you know, in my day. Um, so yeah, Gen Z are definitely the most woke. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to see that in a time where feeling alone is the most characterized when you're a teenager that we can help or that just teens all over the world can feel a little bit less lonely when they're dealing yeah. with their own personal problems. Exactly, 100%. So, and this can be personal or career related. What's the biggest challenge you think you faced and how did you overcome it? That is a very good question. Um, very thought-provoking question and you know I have to say I have to be honest I, I I've been extremely lucky in my life like and I am very blessed and, and well I mean very privileged is probably the word I should be using and I think it's important that I acknowledge that you know I haven't I haven't had any great personal tragedy I've had all you know the the kind of normal challenges that everybody goes through and heartbreak and you know not getting interviews or, or whatever um I suppose for me 
what has become my biggest challenge, and I suppose it's personal and professional, is I do work a lot with children, young people and their families who have had significant tragedy or, or have huge trauma in their lives, you know, whether it's abuse, domestic violence, poverty. Um, and so I'm often working in these very drastic situations and, and learning to balance not letting it affect me personally, you know, to, to still give all the compassion and the empathy that I have, um, but to not burn out from it, you know, because if you're taking every case home with you and you're staying up all night worrying about every case that you have, you know, you're, you're not going to survive the job and you're not really going to help anybody then because you're getting too personally involved. Um, so it's been a learning curve, you know, for me. And I suppose, I don't know if I've used the word overcome it yet. Hopefully I'm getting there. But what helps me manage it, I suppose, is accepting that I can't change everything in a young person's life. Um, I will do the absolute best that I can. And I will try to make a positive difference. But I can't expect to be able to change everything. And, and that accepting that and letting go of that need has, has helped me manage that a little bit better. So I, that has been a big challenge for me because there's, you know, just really tragic, really sad um, instances happening all the time, you know, so. So since that's making up a lot of your professional career, dealing with these very, whether sorrowful or very aggravating circumstances, whether with students or their parents, how do you take care of yourself? Well, self-care, you know, it's kind of a buzzword these days, right? But um, it is, it's so important. And, and I, I hate that because it is important and it starts to lose its value because it's just thrown around all the time. Um, but absolutely, it, it's a priority for me. Um, and, and I really try to, to spend time every day checking in, you know, what have you done for yourself today? What's been helpful for you personally today? Yoga is a massive part of it. As I say, I, you know, I, I teach um, yoga in my spare time. So I have a very regular yoga practice um, and with that, a regular meditation practice. And that, uh, I mean, if I don't get my yoga and my meditation in that day, I'm, I'm not a nice, happy person to be around. So um, I've learned that. And just in general, like having a kind of a healthy lifestyle, eating well, um, even if I'm, you know, feel like I'm too tired to cook something, you know, just making myself have something healthy, um, physical exercise, you know, just getting out and yeah, just staying connected with the important people in my life, you know, um, keep making sure those relationships stay, stay intact and stay strong. Um, and, and yeah, all of those things really help me personally. That's great. You know, we all got to keep ourselves healthy before we can start helping others. At least that's what we think of modern divergence. Oh, hundred percent, you know, and I mean, I, again, it's gotten all very cliche, but you do, you know, you have to, you have to put on your oxygen mask first before you can help the, the person beside you put on theirs. And then it's true, you know, whatever analogy works for you. Um, it's, it's definitely true. So uh, throughout this entire interview, I'm pretty sure you've probably inspired at least a couple people to look towards psychology when they go to college and perhaps for their career. So can you just give us a little bit more detail on the educational process for those aspiring to become a psychologist? So, I mean, probably every country is a little bit different, but in general, um, a bachelor's degree in psychology um, will not, you will not really be a psychologist after that because you have to go on to specialize. So it just, but you will be very qualified and have a very good skill set for lots of different areas. Um, you know, and you, like I said, you may go into things like um, marketing and or, you know, advertising or you could go into teaching and nursing and, you know, but if you want to stay with psychology, uh, typically the route will, the next step will be to do a master's to start to specialize. Um, and then depending again, what type of psychologist you want to be, um, whether it's so clinical or educational and child like myself, um, you will typically go on to do a doctorate most of the time to, to so lots of psychologists are protected terms. So um, you, you have to do a certain amount of training before you can call yourself uh, an educational psychologist, as an example. So you have to go on and do a, usually a three year doctoral um, training program. So, I mean, overall, it, it's a long journey. 
but if you find an area that you're interested in, it doesn't feel like hard work. You know, it's, it's super interesting. So like, I, I mean, I just love psychology. I could talk about psychology all day because it's, it makes you understand yourself. It makes you understand the people in your life. It even helps you understand some of the craziness that's going on in the world at the moment, you know, because I think globally we are going through a mental health crisis. So I always think knowledge is power and psychology will certainly equip you really well and uh, no matter what career you go into and uh, it just depends what you want to specialize in Jeez, you make me want to study psychology um anyway no, i think you should <laughs> <laughs> um so just as a final word what advice would you have for neurodiverse youth especially in this day and age i would say always be true to yourself um there will be stages of your life where it's probably harder to do that than others. Probably your adolescence years are your hardest. Not definitely, but that's quite common. Um, and as much as it may be hard, you know, don't get disheartened. Do stay true to yourself and talk to people. You will be so surprised how other people are feeling probably very similar to you or can be a support to you. Um, and just never be embarrassed of who you are or what you like to do or what your strengths are, you know, really just celebrate your diversity. Diversity is the essence of human nature, you know, think how boring we would be if we were all the same. Um, so really, uh, you know, my main advice would just be really celebrate your diversity, be proud of who you are and, and really value and respect who you are. Um, even though I know that there will be times in your life where that is harder to do. Geez, I like that line, you know, diversity is part of who we are. Thank you so much for this interview. It was very fun to talk to you. Um, I wish you luck in all your endeavors and whatever you're going to be doing, please wish your students, everyone that you work with, good luck um, and have a nice day. Great. Thank you so much. It was really cool to meet you guys.